Okay, we should be on page is that 14. The Baptist Distinctives. This morning for breakfast, I made biscuits. When I made biscuits, I got out flour and I got out, well, actually, I got out self rising flour. Uh, but if I hadn't, I would have got out baking powder, a little bit of salt, maybe a little bit of sugar in there to sweeten it some, buttermilk, and butter. Mixed it all together and made biscuits. Is that the only thing I could have made with those ingredients? Make cake. Make cake. Cookies. Cookies. Huh? Muffins. Muffins. Pancakes. Waffles. Waffles. <laughs> Bread. Yeah. Just a whole bunch of things. So it's the it, there's a unique mixture though of various ingredients that I use certain measurements and combinations in that make the biscuits. I can do the same thing. In the same way, there are certain beliefs that are just Christian, and there are certain practices that are Christian. And as we look over the broad spectrum of different kinds of uh, churches, you see that those same beliefs show up. Some of them are emphasized more than others. Uh, some of the practices mean something else in different contexts and so on, but it's the same thing. And so what we're looking at today then is how these ingredients mix up to become what we call a Baptist. Uh, we could do the same thing and say we're going to look at what a Methodist is, or what a Lutheran is, or a Pentecostal. Um, but since we're a Baptist church, we're going to talk about how, they, how these things mix together to create what a Baptist is. And so there are 11 of these. We're going to start here with this first one. Baptists believe that Jesus is the exclusive Lord of life. Now the emphasis that we would place on the idea that He is the exclusive Lord of life leads us to the idea of uh, religious freedom, expression, freedom to express our faith. Um, <clears throat> because Jesus is the Lord of life, the exclusive Lord of life, we can accept no person or no institution um, to tell the individual how to believe or how to practice their faith. That is solely in the hands of Jesus. And so that's why Baptists have never accepted a state government, a state-run government. Now, if you go back to the days of the, uh, the Reformation, back in the 16th century, um, when Martin Luther started the Reformation, he held on to that belief that we need a state church. We need the church to be there to uh, direct the people into moral uh, obligations and, and ways of doing things to keep order in society. Well, the Anabaptists in those days, the early uh, Baptists, would say, no, we don't need anybody enforcing that because we have, as Christians, we have the Word of God, we have the Spirit of God to lead us to make these decisions. And so, uh, in, in places where there is a state-run religion, every individual is taxed on accordance to a tithe. And as Baptists, we say, no, the government's not going to tax us that way, um, but rather we're going to believe that uh, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the exclusive Lord of life, and we're going to be able to, uh, to give to our church, give to the um, projects or uh, societies that we think are most essential and most important to us based on our own values. So that all stems from the idea that we believe that Jesus is the exclusive Lord of life. Now, this is always open for discussion. Anybody got something you want to mention or ask questions about? Otherwise, we're going to be done really quick. Is that why when they come to the United States, there's so much separation of church and state? Yes. Yeah. That's exactly why. Uh, because in, in the New England colonies, the, the congregational church uh, ran all the... All the public affairs. Uh, anything that was done through the government went through the church. Anything that was done in the church was associated with the government. So that meant then that if you were not a congregationalist, uh, you were either taxed or you were told you can't preach, you can't teach, you can't hold this job, you can't do these things, you can't vote, and so on, because you're not contributing to society through the church. And the Baptists are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, unto God the things that are God. So we have to draw that distinction, that separation between the, way, the world's things and God's things. Same thing was true even in the southern colonies with the uh, uh, 
uh, mainly with the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church. The second Baptist distinctive is Baptists insist that the Bible is the sole, ultimate, written authority for Christian faith and practice. We, everything that we do in a church <coughs> and everything that we believe has to come from one authority, one sole authority, and that has to be the Bible, the Word of God. Now, we do have traditions. Every church has traditions. Traditions are not a bad thing. Traditions are a bad thing when they become, what's the right word? Instituted as the only way, as the way that you do things. And it's a story, everybody's heard it, everybody's told different versions of it. You know, the, uh, the lady that uh, every uh, Christmas when she'd have a ham, she'd cut her ham in half. And uh, the daughter said, Mom, why do you cut the ham in half? Well, she says, I don't know, that's what my mom always did it. Go ask Grandma. Grandma, she goes to Grandma, Grandma, why do you cut the ham in half? And uh, before you bake it, she says, well, I don't know, that's when my mom always did it. Why don't you go ask Great Grandma? So she goes and she asks Great Grandma, Grandma, why do you always cut the ham in half before you bake it? And Great Grandma says, because when I first got married, the pan I had was too small for a whole ham. So I would cook half at a time. Well, that became a tradition, you know. Nobody actually understood why it became a tradition. Uh, I heard the story of the uh, little country Catholic church where the minister had been there, the, the priest had been there forever. And he had his own particular way of doing the, uh, the, uh, the Eucharist, the, the, the Mass, the Communion. And when they got the young guy in, he didn't do it the same way. And so they got together with him, they talked with him and said, you know, why don't you do it the way the old or our, our other priest did. He said, well, how was that? He said, he, before he would do anything, he'd go over and he'd touch the radiator. But what does that have to do with you know, doing uh, uh, communion? And so he got in touch with the older uh, priest and he said, uh, the people are, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> said, because if, if I was giving uh, the wafer to people, it was shocking them. So I'd go over there and, and discharge myself before I'd give the wafer. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it became a tradition. People thought that's the way it had to be. Well, the only tradition that we ought to have, the only authority that we have on what we believe and what we do, has to be the Bible. Because that's the only thing that doesn't change. It's the same day in, day out, throughout the ages. So it's the two distincts of believing that Jesus is the exclusive Lord of life. The Bible is the sole, ultimate, written authority, uh, Christian faith and practice. And when you put these two together, what they're saying, what this says is that nobody can tell you what to believe or what to do. It's all in being led by God as we read the Scripture. The third one then is where these two come together. Baptists believe that God gives people competency. And by that we mean the ability to make choices. The Scripture is filled with commands for us to make a choice. Uh, I think of uh, uh, Joshua in the closing chapter of Joshua uh, where he says... Um, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. You see, the choice is there. You're not forced into making a choice. Every one of us who are believers in Jesus Christ did so because we came to that point in our life where we said, I believe Jesus is my Savior and Lord and I'm going to trust Him. So God gives us that ability, the competency to make choices. The choices that we make are based on these two things. That Jesus is the exclusive Lord of life and that the Bible is the sole written authority that we have. God gives us the right then to make choices, the competency and ability to make choices based on these two things. The fourth thing is the Baptists emphasize that salvation is by God's grace alone through faith alone. Nothing else is needed. There is no prayer that needs to be prayed. There's no action that needs to be done. There's no price that needs to be paid. Um, Salvation is completely free. It is uh, offered to us by grace. An easy way to remember grace, the uh, acrostic, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Everything that God has, He gives to us because Jesus paid the price for it. And so the very, very essence of who God is is God is a giving God. His very nature is that He wants to give. That's what grace is. Uh, and because of the separation of sin that we have 
uh, he then has to offer us grace. And the only way that we receive that grace is through faith. We don't earn it through baptism or through church membership or through doing good works. We can't buy it by giving gifts or offerings or tithes to the church. Uh, we just have to believe, and in believing, we receive. So this is the choice that we make. We have the competency to make choices. Then the choice that we make is to place our faith in Jesus Christ. That's another false Yes, it is. What is it? TGIF. Through grace and faith. Through, through grace and faith. How about you were going to do the faith across it? F-A-I-T-H. I'm trying to remember what that is. Forsaking all, I trust him. That's what yes. I Yes, yes. I have heard that. Number five is the concept of the priesthood of the believer. And that that is basic for Baptists. Baptists insist that all who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior are priests. That's why we don't have priests. You guys who run around in robes with funny haircuts. And then wear, you know, match it to their shirt instead of putting it on forward. Uh, we don't have priests. The word priest, the, the Latin uh, word that priest is derived, derived from is the word that means bridge builder. And so, or, or bridge. Um, I'm thinking, I know in Spanish, uh, the word bridge is puente, and it comes from that Latin word pomp. Uh, you think that the Pope, what is the other term they call him? The pontiff. Pontifus Maximus. He's the chief priest, the high priest. Um, it's also called, you know, the vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ. He is the representative of Christ. Uh, not, not the individual members of the church, and the individual members of the Catholic Church are not looked at as priests. But we can find several places in the Scripture where it says that as we come into that faith relationship with Jesus Christ, that we have complete access to Jesus. And uh, complete access to Jesus means that we have built, or He has built that bridge between man and God. He is that bridge, in fact, between man and God. And uh, <clears throat> we then, as His body as his representatives on earth we serve as the go between between man and God we represent to the world as priests we represent who God is and then through intercessory prayer we represent to God our fellow uh, man uh, we don't need anybody to go between God and us we already have the intercessor and that's Jesus Christ uh, Paul says in uh, I think it's 2 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so He is our mediator. And we then are priests. Uh, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we have been made a kingdom of priests. Each and every one of us. Any questions on these first five? Number six, Baptists believe that baptism is to be by immersion and for believers only. We talked earlier about this, gave the biblical reasons for it. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the idea of baptism as anything but immersion was really not um, fully practiced until about the fourth century. The first two centuries, it was always by immersion. In the third century, you do start to see some of the, uh, um, the changes that are taking place at large in Christianity uh, to get away from it. But uh, by the fourth century, it's commonly practiced by sprinkling or by pouring. Uh, Baptists then are the ones who said, let's get back to the New Testament example of what baptism is. Along with that, many people have read into baptism to say that that is the entrance into the covenant of the church. Uh, and in doing that, then they equate it with um, the, uh, the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament, which was circumcision, which was, hap which was uh, done to uh, infants. And so then the infant baptism then was looked at as the way that people enter into the covenant of the church. Uh, but then certain people look at it also to say that baptism is what washes away original sin and allows us in the hope of heaven. Uh, but as we read the New Testament, we 
come to the conclusion that baptism is done by immersion and the baptism is for believers only. Number seven, Baptists believe in a regenerate church membership. Now what this means is that to be a member of a Baptist church, you're supposed to be a Christian. I'm going to say supposed to be, it's going to have to be. Uh, because a lot of people, well, what do we do to accept people as a member? We accept their word on something, you know. And so if somebody says, well, you have trusted Jesus as my Savior, uh, then that's the qualification that's necessary to become a member of the church. But we we don't have members in the church that have not professed faith in Jesus Christ. The reason we do that is because we read in the New Testament that uh, the Lord added to the church daily such as would be saved. So as people in the New Testament received Christ, that's when they became members of the church. If the church is the body of Christ, then to be part of the body, you need to be in a relationship with Christ. You need to be in a relationship with your Parts of your body have to be in a relationship to your head. And since Jesus is the head of the church, the church is the body of Christ, the individual members then have to be in a relationship with the head. Number eight, one major difference between Baptists and many other denominations is that no person or group outside of a Baptist congregation is to have any authority over the church in regard to beliefs and religious practices. Now, this is really... Very essential, and it doesn't happen with a lot of other Christian organizations, Christian churches. Um, there, in most Christian churches, there is a hierarchy of power or authority uh, that would start with the uh, either the archbishop or the pope or whoever serves in that position, or the synod if it's a group of people uh, that serve in that position. And the authority then flows down from the head to the congregations. Baptist life is tipped over. We start with the congregations and the authority flows down from the congregation to the different organizations. And so uh, we are united in three different uh, partnerships that we have, different organizations within uh, that our church relates to. There's the Wind River Association, uh, the Wyoming Southern Baptist Convention, and the Southern Baptist Convention. And these three entities are it's set up to where these three entities are all equal. Uh, in, in other words, it's, as a director of missions, my authority comes from the local churches. I don't receive authority from the office in Casper. Now, as a church planning catalyst, because I have two relationships, uh, as a church planning catalyst, I'm employed by the North American Mission Board, and my supervisor then is uh, Lynn Nickel in, in Casper. And so I do receive orders from him, so what I do is CPC, but I don't receive orders from him as director of missions because my authority comes from the local congregations. And so uh, uh, in Baptist life, the congregations have the authority. We self-govern, we self-rule, we say this is the way we're going to do things. And if we're, we say we're going to do things this way, and Hillcrest Baptist Church says, well, we're going to do that same thing, but we're going to do it a different way, we look at each other and our response should be, well, amen. Too often, though, I think our response is, well, you heretic. You, you can't do it that way. Why? Because we've never done it that way. Well, big deal if somebody else has never done it that way. Uh, we are under the headship of Jesus, and He directs His body as to how He wants His body to act. And we don't need to all act the same way. If we all act the same way, if we all organize the same way, then we don't need more than one church. But because people feel different, people think different, they're going to relate differently uh, within the congregation just like they do at work, at school, or anywhere else they go. So... <clears throat> To have a congregation direct its own affairs and to believe its own, to have its own authority, really relies on this. We have to have church members who are in an active relationship with Jesus Christ in order to be able to conduct the affairs of His body.
<laughs> it's one line. Baptists believe in church autonomy. These two are very, very closely related. This one's saying that nobody can tell our church what to do. This one's saying we take care of our own affairs. <clears throat> then number 10, this is something that's very different for us, is the Baptists had two ordinances. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. We call them ordinances. What do what other groups call these? Sacraments. Sacraments. The idea of a sacrament is that it conveys salvation power. When you're baptized, that's part of your salvation. When you take the body and the blood of Christ, you receive salvation. Our understanding is that there are ordinances, that is, they were commanded by Jesus, and we're going to do them in obedience to Him. And so... Uh, Baptism was commanded by Jesus in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so as He commands, we're going to be obedient to that. We don't get the, de the, the definition or the meaning of baptism out of that verse. We get it out of other places. Uh, but we realize then that um, the only, only reason that we baptize the... Um, not the only reason. The main reason we baptize is out of obedience to our Lord. He told us to go and make disciples by baptizing. The Lord's Supper, um, <coughs> Jesus commands us to do the Lord's Supper, and then He says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of Me. Now then the question, and I don't know, did, earlier on, did we talk much about the Lord's Supper and the body and blood of Christ. We did, we did a little bit because I said that we never call it communion. We call it Lord's Supper. Supper. Yeah. And that most Baptist churches will call it Lord's Supper. And, and again, I think that's, and I may have mentioned this when we talk about it, is it regionalized? Yeah. Because in different regions of the country they'll call it communion in some places it's Lord's Supper. Um, there are even some Baptists that refer to it as, as a sacrament. Uh, I, I just have a tough time doing that because I know what the definition of a sacrament is. and I don't, There's no grace involved in this. Um, it's done as a, a remembrance. Now what these two have in common though is the baptism of the Lord's Supper is that both of them show the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ and the union that we have with Him. And that's what's so important. You see it so vividly in baptism as uh, you're buried in the water and you're raised up out of the water showing that you have a new quality, a new kind of life. Uh, in the Lord's Supper, Jesus says clearly, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. Now, the discussion that goes all the way back to whenever is what did it mean when Jesus says, this is my body? Well, um, in the 1520s, there was a three-way discussion about this between what the Catholics believe in it, what the... Um, the Lutherans believed he was saying, and what the, uh, at the time that they were known as the, this, this word may blow your mind, Zwinglians. Uh, Guru Zwingli uh, was a, a Swiss reformer. Uh, he was kind of like halfway between Lutheranism and Baptists. Uh, he was kind of just different from all the rest. Uh, but the Catholic understanding is when Jesus says, this is my body, that he meant this, this piece of bread is my body. The Lutherans, Martin Luther came up with this one, that understand that Jesus, His body is standing here. He is holding a piece of bread and saying, this is my body. So obviously, that bread cannot be His body because His body is here. So somehow, spiritually, He's saying that my body is present in this bread. And Zwingli's understanding, which is, is the Baptist understanding, would be to say, no, that he is using just a simple analogy. Just like when he said, I am the door. He didn't mean I'm a piece of wood hanging on two hinges. He is symbolically saying, if you're going to come into the fold, you have to come in through me. And so as he says, this is my body. Eat it in remembrance of me. What he's saying is, this symbolizes my body. And when you take it, you take it in remembrance of me. 
So it doesn't convey any special power or um, divine, uh, miraculous, hocus pocus. Uh, it's just, it's in remembrance of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. We have two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then last, Baptist churches have two officers, pastor and deacon. Now, pastor is sometimes referred to as elder, sometimes he's called shepherd, and sometimes he's called bishop. But they all three refer to the same office, the same person. They just have different influ or, uh, uh, emphasis on what the pastor does. As an elder, he's supposed to be mature. As the shepherd, he's supposed to care for us. He's supposed to take, uh, take care of the sheep. As the bishop, the word uh, bishop means overseer. And so he's the one who oversees the operations <coughs> of the church. So it's not that we have a pastor, an elder, a shepherd, and a bishop. We have a pastor who does three different things. And then a deacon. The word deacon comes from a, word, a Greek word that means to serve, a servant. Actually, it's the word waiter. Uh, it originates in... In Acts chapter 6, there's a little bit of trouble going on in the church. Uh, the, uh, the widows that have a, uh, a Greek origin, uh, a Gentile origin, are not being taken care of, or at least they don't feel like they're being taken care of as well as the Hebrew women. And so they begin to fuss about it, and the apostles say, okay, you know what, uh, we're going to do this this way. You guys look out among yourselves, and you pick some men who are uh, of a good report, filled with the Holy Spirit, and... Uh, We'll put them in charge of waiting tables. And that's the word that's used. Some, some of the uh, English translations say that that's what they're going to be doing. They're going to wait tables. Uh, so it's an office, and a deacon is an officer in the church, and his duty is to help the pastor in doing the work. As the original deacons came in, the apostle said, this will free us up then to do the ministry of the word, to do what we've been called to do, to preach and to pray. So uh, that's why then we have the two offices. As we get further into the New Testament, the book of uh, 1 Timothy and Titus, there's descriptions of the characters of, uh, of the pastor or the elder and the character of the deacon. So these are the Baptist distinctives. This is what, when you mix it together in this way, this is what you get, a Baptist. Now, we're going to mix things up a little bit, and we're going to go ahead and finish everything up tonight. So we're not going to have to come back next week. Why Southern Baptists? <clears throat> there are over 200 different kinds of Baptists in the United States. Most groups of Baptists are very small, they're independent, and some are quite large, and they work together to accomplish the great works that they've been called to do. Uh, many are loosely tied affiliations and fellowships that meet maybe once or twice a year. They meet for encouragement, they meet for training. Uh, but one of the great exceptions is the Southern Baptist Convention. The convention was started in 1845 as a reaction to several historical events that were happening during that time. Uh, the dominant reason was, of course, slavery. If you think back you know, to U.S. history in the 1840s, that was the, the issue, the big issue, uh, was slavery. Baptists in the mid-19th century were asking questions about the morality of slavery. Where in the Bible does it prohibit slavery? It doesn't. Now that became an issue. Why doesn't, if, if the Bible doesn't prohibit it, then what's wrong with it? Well, you know, there's lots of things the Bible doesn't prohibit, but we know that they're wrong anyway. The Bible doesn't prohibit, uh, my mind's blank, is that right now, what would be something wrong? But the other day, uh, prostitution. You know, it does prohibit prostitution. Yeah. That's right. That's what Dean, Dean, one day he said that, and I said, what? But, yeah. But it, and slavery is the same way. It doesn't come right out and say, you shouldn't own slaves. But as you start looking through the Bible and you start placing things together, you realize that not only is uh, slavery not a good idea, it really is a bad idea bad practice, uh, an evil practice, a wicked practice, because you're, if God is not a respecter of persons, and, and He commands us not to be a respecter of persons, and we really, uh, and be right with Him, we cannot make divisions within humanity and say, well, these people are not as good as others, and these people are, uh, you know, 
know, they can't learn. And so because they can't learn, we have to keep them down. You know, that kind of becomes a catch-22 because if you keep them down, they're not going to learn. If they don't learn, if you can't, if they can't learn, they're not going to learn, and so on. So anyway, if it becomes an issue, the New Testament doesn't really say anything about it, but it does say uh, to slave owners, here's how you take care of your slaves. Here's how you... Why would it do that? You realize that in the Roman world, about 70% of the population were slaves. Mm -hmm. So what if Paul had said, free the slaves? <laughs> and as Christianity moved through a world where 70% of the people were slaves, all of a sudden they're free. Free to do what? You know, that would be the downfall of that society because there was no way of taking care of 70% of the people who had been relying on 30% of the people to take care of. And so, there's no prohibition for slavery, but that doesn't make it right. Well, uh, the questions came then about the morality of slave owners, and not only slave owners in particular, but what about ministers and missionaries that own slaves? And that then uh, became the main issue. But then, as we talked a couple of weeks ago, the issues of uh, society versus the convention and how to support missions and all of that, all of that started to come into play so that in 1845, messengers from southern churches met in Augusta, Georgia, and they formed the Southern Baptist Convention to separate themselves from their northern brothers with whom they disagreed. Through the years, since the founding of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention, I think that's the last slide I've got, yeah. So through the years then, uh, there's been many changes in restructuring within the Southern Baptist Convention, but as we look at who, what the convention is today, and we look at the current structure and the organization, uh, we have to consider why has United Baptist Church made a decision to be part of, uh, of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, page 15, we see, we, I mentioned a while ago how a lot of people assume a hierarchy within Christian organizations, and a lot of people would look at the Southern Baptist Convention this way to say that, you know, there's the Baptist Pope in Nashville uh, sits at the top of the pyramid, and then uh, the, the Baptist Archbishop in Casper. Uh, is the next level, and then the Baptist, I don't know what I would be uh, with the association, and then you get down to the church. And that, that's the wrong way of looking at it. The Monsignor. Oh, the Monsignor, is that what I am? I'm the, I'm the Wind River Monsignor. Um, you can call better things, huh? <laughs> I've been called worse, too, I think. I'm not really sure what a Monsignor is, but I know I've been called something, and I do know what it is. <laughs> Some would think that the way... Southern Baptists are organized is that all the churches form an association and then this association and this association and this one they all join together and they make a state convention and then all the different states have a convention and they all join together and they make the Southern Baptist Convention. Well that's not uh, the way it works either. So on the next page, hopefully you yeah, we get that there. This is how it does work. You've got all the churches join together to form an association. An association is a, um, a geographic region. Uh, it's, it's the one that is, it's the level of denominational life that is closest to the local congregation. Then all the churches... Do still have monthly um, associational meetings, business meetings, and stuff like that? We didn't have enough business to conduct them monthly. Nobody wanted to come. So we figured once a year. Yes, we do it once a year now. Okay. It could be a biannual kind of annual. Well, and we have that in our Constitution. It's just that I found the same thing is true with the biannuals, with the annual, or the monthly meetings. We just don't have enough business. But then it seems like things always crop up that has to be taken care of. And so we've, we've organized, we've reorganized where we have an administrative team. So that when something shows up that needs to be taken care of, I can call the members of the administrative team and we can do that kind of business and then report it at the annual meeting. So the only time that we can do anything officially, though, is when the association joins together. Bless you. It's just like the Southern Baptist Convention really doesn't exist but two days a year. 
That's when all the messengers come together at the annual meeting in June. That's the only time the convention exists. The other times we have an executive committee that takes care of all the business uh, of the of different things that we do. So anyway, the churches make up the association, they make up the state convention, and then the churches make up the Southern Baptist Convention. So that the diagram that you have on page 16 uh, on the right shows how the various churches um, join together to create three different entities, three entities that are equal. There are a number of churches uh, that affiliate with a local association. Those same churches with others added affiliate the state convention. Uh, with other churches across the country, they are affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. Associations are the smallest units of organization, but they're closest to the churches geographically. All units are equidistant from the churches and are therefore neither superior nor inferior to one another. Each entity is freestanding and autonomous, but interrelated because each entity is made up of the same churches. Now, if that is as clear as mud, welcome to the club. But then what Dale runs into so many times is whenever they they have a pastor who's going to leave or not leave, but conflict in the church. They want Dale to come down and kick the preacher out. And he can't do that. Nope. I cannot come into a church and tell the church how to run their affairs. Now, if we were Methodist, I could. Yeah. <laughs> but because we're Baptists, I can come in and I can sit down with the two disagreeing parties and I can say, hey, you guys need to work something out. And I'll help you work it out. You know, I can work that way, but I can't come in and say, okay, Pastor, you're wrong. Out of here. Or say, troublemaker, you've already been in three of our churches and caused trouble in all three of them, so you're out of here. I would love to be able to do that kind of stuff, uh, run things my way, but it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> what really makes Southern Baptist today is the cooperative program. The basic purpose of the Southern Baptist Convention and denomination is to aid and assist the churches in, uh, in the doing of their divinely guided work. The SBC Charter says the convention was created for the purpose of eliciting combining and directing the energies of the Baptist denomination of Christians for the pro propagation of the gospel. So these three terms, eliciting, combining, and directing, that is what has led to the um, creation of the cooperative program. Now, rather than go through all of this and how the cooperative program works, if I can find it, I have a video. Um, Zooming down the information highway here. Come on. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Do what? Every time that happens. Thanks, Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, I get to sign in again. hard to hear because my speakers I don't be speaker. There are more than 
7 billion people in the world today. Although it's nearly impossible to calculate, we can estimate that fewer than 20% know Jesus as their Savior. As someone who knows Jesus, the staggering reality of the world's lostness reminds us of the importance of the Great Commission. But what can you, one person, do? Or what can your church, a single congregation, accomplish? The truth is, you can make a big difference through the cooperative program. CP is how Southern Baptists do missions, pooling the tithes and offerings from even the most humble incomes, and even the smallest churches, to reach around the world for Christ. Through the cooperative program, church planting like set free churches, redeem broken lives, and rescue people from addictive lifestyles. CP Giving has also planted cowboy churches that share the gospel and touch lives in ranching communities, along with many other unreached communities across our state. Through cooperative program giving in Wyoming, we are able together to support churches as they develop and carry out special evangelism projects to reach their communities with the gospel. Like Catch a Fire Men's Outreach in Hyattville that drew 100 and saw 10 saved. Or the Wild Gate Dinner event in Riverton that will have impact on men and boys there. Here's how the cooperative program works. It starts with you giving yourself first to the Lord and then giving back to Him through your tithes and offerings. Your church sends a portion of those tithes and offerings to the Wyoming Southern Baptist Convention, which sends a percentage of its annual budget to the Southern Baptist Convention. The rest goes into training events, consultations, ministry coaching and resources, and working support for virtually every area of ministry from convention and associational staff to strengthen local churches all over Wyoming. Finally, the SBC supports missions and ministries in North America and around the world, from seminaries to religious liberty to disaster and hunger relief to keeping more than 10,000 missionaries on the field. Because you give, because your local church gives, and because we cooperate as Southern Baptists, Together we are fulfilling the Great Commission, the cooperative program. It begins with you and reaches into eternity. Probably one of the best descriptions of the proper program I've ever seen. Who do that? They got this from somebody uh, in Missouri. Oh. That uh, they had done it for the Missouri convention, and when Lynn Nichols saw it, he said, "Can you do this for us?" And I, this, this is the way the Southern Baptists work, because we have this partnership. We're able to to get resources from other places. Uh, so you know. It, I've known so many. In fact, I'm working with a church in Cody right now that uh, um, has been part of the Montana Convention, and they've had a lot of people join from different church backgrounds that are now saying, what is Southern Baptist, and why are we not a Wyoming church? Why are we a Montana church? And so this is the kind of stuff we're explaining to them as they say, oh, you know, they begin to see it. And well, we never did missions like this. Uh, but I think the, the one thing that was so cool about this, I think, is that it is very local for us. It talks about Set Free, Cowboy Church with the Cowboy Church in Lander today, uh, the Catch a Fire, uh, Shane Scott's a missionary who was a supporting church planner in Hyattville. They did the, the Catch a Fire, and then Hillcrest did the uh, uh, Men and Boys Outreach. Taylor went to that. And I know that ball game, I'm not sure what you went. Beaver. Huh? Beaver. Beaver. <laughs> All right, we're going to quickly close here. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, page 18, the Southern Baptist Convention structure and board and agencies. Uh, there are six seminaries that we support through the cooperative program. And uh, if you want to write these in, I'll tell you where they are. Over there in California, the one star, that is Golden Gate Seminary. And uh, Mills. Richard. No, I'm trying to the, the name of the town that it's in. California. Yeah, it's in California. It's, it's, it's in the San Francisco <laughs> Bay area. Okay. Then down in Texas, you see there's two stars there. Uh, one of them is a seminary. The one to the left is Fort Worth. That is the uh, Southwestern Baptist Seminary. There's a longer title. But... Southwestern Baptist Seminary. Yeah. 
the other star is in Dallas, and that is Guidestone. And what Guidestone is is that they do uh, retirement plans for ministers. They do insurance. Um, the financial thing, and they always get these because they have made a commitment to say we are not going to support, we're not going to put any Southern Baptist money into certain organizations like they do abortions or um, tobacco industry, anything like that. The, uh, their figures, like I think for the last year, uh, quarterly reports, all four of them, they're in like the top three in the Lipper. Uh, you never hear about them. But they're real good. Uh, the next star over in Louisiana is New Orleans Baptist Seminary. And then the one that's up there at Kansas City between Kansas and Missouri is Midwest Baptist Seminary. Moving over. Is that in Kansas or Missouri? It is in Missouri. It is in Missouri. It's on the Missouri side. Um, the next one here in Kentucky is at Louisville, Kentucky, is Southern Baptist Seminary. That was the first of our seminaries. It was founded in 1859. Below that, in Tennessee, that's uh, Nashville. There are two things there at Nashville. Lifeway, Lifeway Christian Resources. It used to be the uh, Baptist Sunday School Board. They're the ones who make our Sunday School literature. They have bookstores all across the country. Um, they're one of the largest mailers in, in, the, in the world, actually. And also at Nashville, that's where the executive committee is. Then the big star that fell on Alabama, there in the middle. Uh, at Birmingham, that is the Women's Missionary Union, WMU. Across the state in Georgia, Alpharetta, which is a suburb of Atlanta, is the North American Mission Board. Up in North Carolina is Southeast Baptist University or uh, Seminary, and that is at. And then in Virginia, at Richmond, is the International Mission Board. So you, you can tell by looking at this that the, the reason that we've come together as Southern Baptists is really to do two things. Support education and support missions. Okay, we are done.